The president, uh, the deputy is ready, and the co-prosecutor is now advised to continue his uh, submission. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just to repeat, I would refer the court to paragraph 162 of the pretrial chamber judgment, which I think uh, this is the judgment uh, on the appeal against the closing order, which contains a very useful chronology of the People's Revolutionary Tribunal's activities. Now, the People's Revolutionary Tribunal was created not by law, but by a decree of the People's Revolutionary Council of Campuchia. That document is D288 backslash 6.9 backslash 9.3. Since it's largely accepted in law that a court is normally created by law through a sovereign parliament and not by subsidiary regulation, the very basis of the establishment of the People's Revolutionary Tribunal is questionable. Now, the text of that decree, if you look at it, expresses the views of the executive branch of the government in respect of the, of the guilt of the accused in that case, Yang Seri and Pol Pot, before there had even been an investigation or the trial had even commenced. At least three members of the court were also members of the government. The Minister of Information of the time, Mr. Kia Chanda, was also the president of the court. And two assessors were government employees, and that you will find in the book Genocide in Cambodia, which has records of this tribunal. That's D427 backslash 1 backslash 17.1.133 at pages 56 and 57. This is a book that contains the remaining records of the court. Now, the president of the court held a press conference on the 28th of July of 1979, in which he declared the Pol Pot Yang Seri clique guilty of crimes including genocide. Three days after the opening of an investigation, and again before the trial had even started, and you'll find that on page 47 of the same book that I've referred to, Genocide in Cambodia. Two of the assessors in the court who appear by virtue of the decree which established the court to have powers equivalent to the presiding judge at the trial provided evidence to the court, one in the pretrial stage and the other as an expert. And again, you'll find that material in the same book, Genocide in Cambodia, pages 335 to 337 and 56 to 57. One of the defence counsel appointed in absentia for the accused gave a statement for the prosecution during the investigation, and that you will find at pages 134 to 138 of the same book that I referred to. There was no cross-examination of witnesses, even though the right had been enumerated beforehand. That you will find referred to at page 16. No evidence was offered in defence of the accused. No meaningful arguments were presented in closing. Indeed, Mr. Hope Stevens of the United States and one of Yang Seri's defense counsel described the, the crimes committed as disgusting and unspeakable and declared Pol Pot and Yang Seri to be criminally insane monsters. And that you will find at page 504. Witness statements re relied on at trial appeared to be stage managed. Witness statements used similar jargon like the Pol Pot Yang Seri clique referring to the two individuals as traitors. And that you'll find at page 75, page 102 to 103, page 120, page 122, and page 127. The length of the proceedings were 20 days from the opening of the investigation. Five days were allocated to trial. On the last day of the trial, August the 19th, 1979, there were statements of the defense, closing arguments for the parties, deliberations by the judges and delivery of a 31-page judgment, all in a day, indicating in my submission that guilt had been predetermined in this case. And that you will find at pages 67 to 69. And yet the defence are requesting you apply the principle of nabis in Edom and are asking you to respect 
these judicial proceedings in paragraph 9 of their supplementary submissions. Proceedings which we accept had very limited resources but did not even meet the most basic standards of a fair trial. The defence at paragraph 10 of their supplementary submissions argues that one of the purposes of the double jeopardy rule is to spare an individual from undergoing all of the, phys the physiological, emotional, physical and monetary stress associated with criminal prosecution twice. As my learned colleague Chi Liang has already pointed out, Yang Seri was not even present for the trial and he didn't even suffer the sentence imposed against him. He simply was not there for trial and he was not there for imposition of the sentence. So to suggest that he suffered stress during a trial for which he was not even there is not convincing. My submission to you, Your Honours, is that double jeopardy simply does not apply in this case for all the reasons that we've stated both now and in our written submissions. I would respectfully request that you dismiss this argument. Please let us get on with the trial. Thank you. The President, uh, thank you, Mr. Co-Prosecutor. We now proceed to the lead co-lawyers for the civil parties, if um, they would wish uh, to make some observation. Some uh Council Big Ang, Mr. President. Uh, the lead co-lawyers would like uh, permission from the chamber to allow two civil party lawyers uh, of making such um, observation, Mr. Uh, Ms. Mochawanari and uh, Mrs. Uh, Martin Chakang. The president, uh, we allow uh, you both to uh, make the observation for 30 minutes altogether. Thank you, Mr. President, for giving us the floor to make our response to the defense. First of all, um, good afternoon, uh, Your Honours. My name is Mike Sobanari. On behalf and for the interests of the victims who are severe parties in this case, we would like to express our position in support of all arguments raised by the co-prosecutors. In addition to the written response of the civil parties filed to the chamber on the 6th of June 2011. And we will make further submissions with the emphasis on some legal arguments and views from the victims of these serious international crimes when it comes to the application of Nebis Sin Indium. In all cases, I support that the International Court of the former Yugoslavia was right when it comes to the application of Nebis Sin Indium. And this is the jurisprudence which the Trials Chamber shall uphold that is the international criminal crimes shall be punished i also uphold a firm position that this principle does not prevent the prosecution of mr Insery before this court because this his 1979 trial was not conducted independently impartially or in line with the equal trial standards. Therefore, the requirement for uh, impartiality, independence or 
equal rights were not satisfied in the proceeding before the national court. Before my colleague, Martin Jiakang, to take the floor to give further details in the relations to Mr. Ian Siri 1979 trial, I would like to uh, present a number of grounds that support the exception of Nebisinidum, in which we must consider also the views of the victim who claim that their rights and interests will be overlooked when an international law court does not apply procedures of international standards which support the exception of this principal application. According to the uh, criminal procedures of each court, uh, of each uh, state, uh, the Nibasani them shall not be applied if the trials were not conducted uh, under norms of due process or international standard. The internationalized court and procedures uh, have the fair uh, or uh, guarantee the judicial safeguards and that uh, if a court has not really maintained such a procedures, then uh, it shall be rendered as not really fair for uh, the uh, person involved. Uh, according to the International Covenant uh, on Civil and Political Rights, um, It is correct that uh, no one shall be liable to be tried or punished uh, again for an offence for which he has already been finally convicted or acquitted in accordance with the law and penal procedure of each country. However, uh, the trials uh, were back then not uh, of uh, such a standard. According to the Commission, uh, the Human Rights Commission report on its 48th session uh, indicate uh, very clearly concerning the principle of Nebis in Idem and okay. The President, uh, the interpreter have uh, notified us that uh, you uh, spoke uh, too fast uh, and that uh, your message uh, should uh, cannot be fully um, covered. Uh, so please slow down a little bit for record. Okay. Moisvaneri continues. We support that the pretrial chamber has uh, ruled uh, already on the appeal against the closing order, and and according to the same report of the International Law Commission on the work of its forty eighth session, six of May to uh, uh, to twenty six of July, nineteen ninety six. Uh, it states uh, that uh, if the national jurisdiction has not been upheld uh, pursuant to the norms of due process, uh, that uh, the international community shall not be bound uh, by the result of such uh, unfair trials. And I would like to stress that uh, this statement has been fully supported uh, by the uh, declaration of the Amnesty International. We also maintain that uh, the exception <coughs> with regard to uh, these uh, nebis and idem shall not really damage uh, what we call the complementary principle. For example, if uh, there is shortcomings uh, in the national procedures. It is different uh, from what the defense has indicated. Uh, Nebis and Idem, with regard to the same fact, 
has all ha, has been intended uh, for the truth and justice according to the trial uh, as, according to the judgment or the decision on the, the appeal filed by Ian Sari's team it has to be balanced Uh, that uh, the fair trials uh, has to be uh, maintained for the purpose of the interests of the client, uh, the victims in particular, and this balance shall be struck. And that uh, before this court, uh, we shall not only answer to the requirement of legality, but at the same time, we need to answer to the need of humanity. And we hope that the trial chamber sh uh, will rule on several legal arguments. And uh, we believe that uh, the trial chamber will also look into the observations ma or comments uh, made uh, by the victims. For victims, if the trial, the trial in 1979 were not fair and that their rights have not uh, been fully respected because victims have been deprived of their right to understand the full truth of the events that happened uh, back then during the Khmer Rouge regime. This tribunal is, of course, the final hope for victims, victims who really rely heavily upon the court so that their rights and dignity can be restored. The trials in all kind of uh, criminal procedures against uh, humanity, the trial, the chamber shall uh, be bound uh, or expected to answer to the needs and expectation of the victims, because victims need to understand the truth, the truth that they have been long waiting for, so that they can really move on with life, with uh, hope. As the Amnesty International already indicated, uh, the international community has a legitimate uh, role to claim for fairness uh, for victims uh, through, uh, through trials because uh, it is of course intended to make sure that such crimes shall never be reintroduced or occurred and that uh, reparations, uh, uh, proper reparations shall be rewarded uh, to the victims. And that if the, fair uh, if the trials have not been conducted fairly, then these reparations and fairness would have been deprived of uh, from the accused, uh, from the rather victims. It is very important and, of course, vital for the younger generation to uh, see that uh, the trials are fair because uh, if the trials are fair, it, uh, the truth has been revealed through that particular uh, trial. And uh, we have observed that uh, from the Nuremberg Tribunal, the proceedings have been improved and that the international community really put more focuses on the eradication of impunity and the restoration of victims' dignity and interests. And for that reason, any person who has committed uh, severe crimes of that magnitude shall not be, um, shall not enjoy any impunity at all. And uh, once again, if trials were not conducted properly or fairly, the rights of the parties concerned uh, would not have been properly uh, respected. And these uh, 
tribunal, as we believe, uh, will not really take the exception of the Nepis and Idem before it's and the culture and, and that the Cambodian people and the royal government of Cambodia will also look forward to see uh, that uh, the accused uh, be prosecuted. And I would like uh, to refer to a case uh, in France uh, concerning the accused uh, who uh, has been charged with persecution against uh, the Jewish. In 1946, that person was sentenced to death in absentia. However, the sentence term was not served. In 1971, he was, part, uh, uh, he was given amnesty or pardoned by uh, the senior head of uh, France. However, the victims were not very happy and that complaint was reintroduced uh, so that the person uh, be put into uh, uh, liable for the crimes uh, he uh, committed uh, and proper investigation was, uh, re uh, was conducted again. In 1975, uh, the person was sentenced to life of imprisonment. I would like to draw your attention to this particular case because we would like to stress that the victims uh, cannot really tolerate uh, the culture of impunity in whatever aspect, uh, and that uh, their voice was heard uh, and they were successful. I think uh, as uh, victims, we believe that the ECCC would not really step back. The ECC will continue listening to the voices of the victims and that uh, they will help victims to break the silence. And our humble request is that the Nebis and Edem shall not uh, be applied here as it would really violate the rights of the victims uh, should it be uh, introduced. We would like, I would like now to uh, share the floor with uh, Mrs. Uh, Martin Chaka. Mr. Mr. President. Your Honours, good afternoon. Before proceeding, allow me to impress upon you how moved I am to plead before you again on behalf of the civil parties. I will use the time allotted to me to share with you three remarks pertaining firstly to the August 1979 judgment, statements made by the accused, and thirdly, I wish to speak on the Tuvier case and cited as jurisprudence. First and foremost, I wish to draw your attention on some of the elements of the judgment that was issued in 1979. As a civil party lawyer, I would have liked to see you, the accused, summon the courage to rupture defense and explain to the civil parties the following. At what point in time and why did your revolutionary project plunge into the realm of terror, torture, and murder? But what you seek and what you ask for during these final chapters of your life is impunity and denial of the reality that unfolded in Cambodia between 1975 and 1979, and to seek shelter behind the first judgment of August 1979 that was issued in Phnom Penh, which was followed by a pardon. The name of that tribunal was the, People's Tri was the People's Revolutionary Tribunal that was set up in Phnom Penh to try the crime of genocide committed by the Pol Pot Yen Seri clique. It sought only to try the crime of genocide. That was its sole jurisdiction. Pol Pot and Yen Seri were charged with the following crimes. Firstly, 
Systematic execution of a plan to massacre, a plan that became increasingly unrelenting of all cadres and specifically former officials and members of the Lon Nol administration. Secondly, the elimination of ethnic minorities. And thirdly, the elimination of all enemies, even those imagined. The forced evacuation from the cities and systematic displacement of entire populations caused the death of many people. The regime was structured in a way by using repression and coercion through forced labor and enslavement of an entire population to the point of physical and psychological annihilation. The destruction of all social bonds and connections, restrictions on freedom of thought. Man became a slave whose soul link was subordinate to Ankar. There was systematic elimination of all members of religious orders, monks, Muslims, and believers and intellectuals. There was the massacre of children. There was the brainwashing of teenagers to mold them into torturers stripped of any human quality. And lastly, there was the sabotaging of the national economy which condemned an entire population to starvation. Those were the charges launched by the prosecutors. Witnesses took the stand and some of whom may, we may hear again during these new proceedings. Some inquiries and investigations were carried out specifically at Tulsing. Reports were tabled. And a death sentence was handed to you, the accused, Mr. Yang Sari. You were not there, but your defense was heard, and a judgment was rendered. The facts were retained, and liability recognized. You were not there, but you were defended. And again, the facts were retained. Your liability was determined, and a death sentence was pronounced. However, you, Mr. Yang Sari, you, the accused person, you never acknowledged the validity of that judgment. You could have decided to accept that legal decision in its entirety and all of its consequences. However, that was not your choice. In an interview with Mr. Jean-Francois Tain that took place in November 1996, you stated publicly on the radio the following words, and I quote you. Remember that the 1979 tribunal sentenced me to death. It was not legitimate because the tribunal was organized during the Vietnamese occupation. It is useless to backtrack. I am not guilty. Mr. Tanvan asked Mr. Yang Sari the following question. In the event that a tribunal is established in the short or medium term, be it a national or international court to try the crimes of the Khmer Rouge, do you truly believe you can escape justice? The accused answered this. You know fully well that no tribunal or trial will ever take place on Cambodian ter territory. I cannot accept the idea that a genocide happened in Cambodia. But what must be acknowledged is that the implementation of policies at the time caused immense drama, had caused immense damage and profound trauma amongst the Cambodian people. I wish to say that I greatly regret this. And then why, Mr. Yang Sari, why do you refuse to explain yourself today before the Cambodian people, before this international tribunal that is being held in Cambodia, that has given you a chance to speak and is willing to listen to you. And lastly, I wish to recall the Tuvier case. On September 17, 1946, Paul Tuvier was sentenced to death by the Court of Justice of Lyon. He was also sentenced again in March 1947, the same sentence by the Court of Justice of Chambéry. Paul Touvier was to be pardoned by presidential decree issued by Georges Pompidou in 1972. 
The pardon would have been relative to the two death sentences he received in 1946 and 1947 in Chambéry. In 1973 in Lyon, and in 1974 in Chambéry. The children of victims filed complaints for crimes against humanity. In 1976, the Court of Cassation, the final Court of Appeal, relying on international conventions, declared that prosecution was not time barred. It then followed that the final Court of Appeal, by its decision of October 12, 1993, dismissed Touvier's appeal on the ground that the principle of non bis in idem was not, was not applicable in this case. In light of the new characterization of the facts, namely the crime against humanity. By decision dated April 20th, 1994, Paul Touvier was sentenced to a life imprisonment by the Assis Court of Yveline for adding and abetting crimes against humanity. In conclusion, Mr. President, Your Honours, my thoughts are the following. Can justice heal or manage the suffering of, or mitigate the, suf the suffering of victims? Justice can only restore whatever harm is reparable and whatever injury for which victims can claim compensation. But justice cannot restore that which is beyond reparation, the physical and psychological wounds and scars that are borne by the victims for an entire lifetime. But at the very least, this trial can ascertain the truth, acknowledge facts, provide a sense of tranquility for victims, and bring closure to their process of grieving. A trial can also allow victims to manifest their desire for reparations, precisely today, those are the demands of the civil parties who wish to be heard before this tribunal. I thank you, Mr. President. The President, uh, thank you, councillors, for the civil party. We have already observed uh, observations, and it has been intense because we did not really observe um, mid-session adjournment, uh, and I think uh, it is now an appropriate time to already adjourn for today. So the chamber will take the adjournment uh, now, and that uh, tomorrow's session will be resumed uh, by 9 o'clock. Personal security officers are now advised uh, to bring the accused back to the detention facility and return them to the courtroom by 9 a.m. The greffier all rise.